non-probability sampling methods purposive quota convenience voluntary snowball non-probability sampling this type of sampling does not involve random selection and methods are not based on the rationale of probability theory it is a sampling method in which not all members of the population have an equal chance of participating in the study sampling methods under non-probability sampling includes purposive quota convenience voluntary and snowball purposive sampling is a non-probability sampling procedure that involves selecting elements based on a researcher's judgment about which elements will facilitate his or her investigation it is a type of sampling that involves selecting based on characteristics of a population and the objective of the study this non-probability sampling involves the researcher using their expertise to select a sample that is most useful to the needs or purposes of the research it is also known as judgment sampling or deliberate sampling here's how to do purposive sampling for example consider a scenario where a researcher decides to understand what are the factors which lead a person to select a medical profession having a medical profession has been recently attracting the youth more and more people are selecting it as a profession the researchers who understand what the medical profession is will be able to decide who should form the sample to learn about it as a profession that is when judgmental sampling is implemented researchers can easily filter out those participants who can be eligible to be a part of the research sample thus the researchers may only select for their sample only those in the medical profession like physicians nurses medical technologists pharmacists resident doctors medical interns or college students under a medical related course another example you want to know more about the opinions and experiences of disabled students at your university thus you purposefully select a number of students with different support needs in order to gather a varied range of data on the opinions and experiences of those persons with disability next example you may select individuals based on those with expertise in a certain area on participants with unique or special characteristics collecting a very specific set of participants for example age 20 to 24 college educated male and selecting individuals who have experienced certain events or phenomenon related to your research topic in general one major advantage of purposive sampling is that it's easier to make generalizations about your sample since all participants have the characteristic you are studying the researchers knowledge and skill in selecting individuals is primarily important in this sampling process since it is a tedious task to carefully handpick members that comply with certain required or chosen characteristics quota sampling it is a non-probability sampling procedure that involves describing the target population in terms of what are thought to be relevant criteria and then selecting sample elements to represent the relevant subgroups in proportion to their presence in the target population quota sampling means taking a very tailored sample that is in proportion to some characteristic or trait of a population but the researcher has the option to set a quota higher or lower than the proportion seen in the population here is how to do quota sampling you could divide a population into groups by the state they live in 
income, education level, or sex. The population is divided into groups, and samples are taken from each group to meet a quota. Care is taken to maintain the correct proportions representative of the population. For example, if your population consists of 55% female, and 45% male, your sample should also reflect those percentages. In quota sampling, you may divide the population into subgroups. These should be exclusive. For example, you might divide employees by type of educational degree. Then, figure out the proportion of subgroups to the population. For example, employees who have an English degree might be 1 out of 4. Choose your sample size. For example, if you are sampling 10,000 people, you might have a quota sample of 100. Choose participants, being careful to adhere to the subgroup's characteristics. For this example, 25% of your sample should have an English degree. The selection process continues until your quotas are filled. Another example of quota sampling, let's say the researcher is investigating views on the health safety, and wants to make sure the elderly are included in the survey. The population may consist of 7% aged 65 years and above. But the researcher changes the quota to 9%, to ensure the views of the elderly are included. The inclusion of certain senior citizens, has come at the expense of a truly representative sample. A researcher wants to survey individuals about what smartphone brand they prefer to use. He or she considers a sample size of 500 respondents. Also, he or she is only interested in surveying 10 cities. Here's how the researcher can divide the population by quotas. Gender, 250 females and 250 males. Age, 100 respondents each between the ages of 16 to 20, 21 to 30, 31 to 40, 41 to 50, and 51 plus. Employment status, 300 employed, and 200 unemployed people. Researchers may apply further nested quotas. For example, out of the 200 unemployed people, 100 must be students. Location, 50 responses per city. Depending on the type of research, the researcher can apply quotas based on the sampling frame. It is not necessary for the researcher to divide the quotas equally. He or she divides the quotas based on his or her need. Quota sampling is inexpensive, easy to administer, fast to create and complete. Since selection is not random, selection bias might pose some problems. You might avoid choosing people who live farther away, or people in difficult and hard to reach areas, and those in rough or dangerous locations. This may make the result unrepresentative of the population. Convenience sampling is a non-probability sampling procedure that involves selecting individuals that are readily accessible to the researcher, or include those people who are easy to reach. This is an easy and inexpensive way to gather initial data, but there is no way to tell if the sample is representative of the population. Results from these samples are easy to analyze but hard to reproduce. While you can use any analysis method you like, you will not be able to generalize your results to the larger population. Convenience sampling is sometimes called accidental or grab sampling.
How do you do convenience sampling? For example, let's say you are conducting a survey for a company. They wanted to know what mega shopping mall employees think of their wages. It is unlikely you will be able to get a list of employees. So you may have to resort to standing outside of the mall and grabbing whichever employees come out of the door. Another example. You are researching opinions about food services in your university, so after each of your classes, you ask your fellow students to complete a survey on the topic. This is a convenient way to gather data, but as you only surveyed students taking the same classes as you at the same level, the sample is not representative of all the students at your university. You could also survey people from your workplace, your school, a club you belong to, along busy street corners, in front of restaurants or food shops, the cafeteria, or the local mall. Although convenience sampling is, like the name suggests, convenient, it runs a high risk that your sample will not represent the population. However, sometimes a convenience sample is the only way you can drum up participants. Similar to a convenience sample, a voluntary response sampling is mainly based on ease of access and willingness of individuals. Instead of the researcher choosing participants, and directly contacting them, people volunteer themselves. For example, by responding to a public online survey, voluntary response samples are always at least somewhat biased, as some people will inherently be more likely to volunteer than others. How do you do voluntary sampling? For example, you send out the survey to all students at your university, and a lot of students decide to complete the survey on food services. This can certainly give you some insight into the topic, but the people who responded are more likely to be those who have strong opinions about the topic, so you can't be sure that their opinions are representative of all students. Let's have some more examples on voluntary sampling. A TV show host asks his viewers to visit his website, and respond to an online poll. A restaurant owner leaves comment cards on all of its tables, and encourages customers to participate in a brief survey to learn about their overall experience. Voluntary sampling, includes people who take the time to respond to a survey, but they tend to have similarly strong opinions compared to the rest of the population. Often, voluntary response samples oversample people who have strong opinions and undersample people who don't care much about the topic of the survey. Snowball sampling is a non-probability sampling technique in which existing subjects provide referrals to recruit samples required for a research study. This is a sampling method used for types of research in which the samples have traits that are rare to find. Snowball sampling method is purely based on referrals, and that is how a researcher is able to generate a sample. Thus, this method is also called the chain referral sampling method. How to do snowball sampling For example, if you are studying the level of customer satisfaction among the members of an elite golf club, you will find it extremely difficult to collect primary data sources, unless a member of the club agrees to have a direct conversation with you, and provides the contact details of the other members of the club. Another example you are researching experiences of homelessness in your city. Since it is extremely difficult to find a list of all homeless people in a city, you meet two homeless individuals who agree to participate in the research. 
and they put you in contact with other homeless people that they know in the area. You as a researcher can continue to tap as many homeless people you can find through the reference provided. Till you know you have collected enough data for your research. For some population, snowball sampling is the only way of collecting data and meaningful information. The following are the instances, where snowball sampling can be used. No official list of names of the members, this sampling technique can be used for a population, where there is no easily available data like their demographic information. For example, homeless or list of members of an elite club, whose personal details cannot be obtained easily. Difficulty to locate people, people with rare diseases are quite difficult to locate. However, if a researcher is carrying out a research study similar in nature, finding the primary data source can be a challenge. Once he or she is identified, they usually have information about more such similar individuals. People who are not willing to be identified, if a researcher is carrying out a study which involves collecting information or data, from victims of sexual assault or individuals who are sex workers, these individuals will fall under this category. Secretiveness about their identity People who are religious extremists or hackers usually fall under this category. A researcher will have to use snowball sampling to identify these individuals and extract information from them. 